but we are running short of time. So what we'll do now, we'll move on to the third uh, session, which is on uh, future trends of India-China relations. And we will um, sort of uh, delay lunch break a little bit, so that we have some time for this very important session. We'll take lunch break at yeah, about 1.15, 1.20, we'll take lunch break. We'll start with uh, Dr. Fugel. Okay. Ravi, maybe we would like you to speak first. Good morning and uh, uh, welcome to the delegation. Thank you for this opportunity to be uh, to make a few comments about future trends in India-China relations. Now, when talking about the future, um, of course, it is uh, hope, but hopefully it is a hope based on facts and logic. So I'm going to talk about what the potential is for India-China's future relations based on some of the patterns that have been observed worldwide in world geopolitics and geoeconomics. Let me start with just a few figures. India-China trade in the year that was just finished in March 2019 came up to $100 billion with a slight re reduction in the deficit. We might think this is a very good number, and in fact it is, if you look at the fact that it was only $2 billion about 15 years ago. But it is really very little compared to China-Vietnam trade, which is more than that. It is only one-third of China-Korea trade. It is only one-fourth of China-Japan and one-fifth of China-US. Now, what do these figures reveal? It reveals, firstly, one thing. China has geopolitical issues with Vietnam, with Japan, and with the US. They are very well known. However, there is also huge economic engagement, which I have just spelled out. The two work in balance. I am not saying that economic engagement can solve geopolitical problems, but economic engagement does help to manage geopolitical problems and can create the context in future, perhaps, to solve geopolitical problems. The reason being that the wider your economic stake is, the more people are involved in the outcomes of these economic relations and you create actual stakes for millions of people. So there has to be, as a future trend, I hope, a better balance between what I call the geopolitical issues between India and China and the geoeconomic issues. In short, there is an excess of geopolitical issues which creates a negative feedback in public perception because these geopolitical issues are not being solved. On the other hand, since the geoeconomic connectivity is so much below the potential possible between the two largest economies in the world measured in PPP terms other than the US, we are nowhere near the potential and therefore are not delivering the possible public benefits in both the countries, in both China and India, which would benefit by this kind of connectivity. So, there is a negative on one side and there is a huge loss of potential on the other side. And from the field of business and industry, which has been my background, if you put this proposition to a business person, he knows very clearly what the answer is. You have to increase the economic connectivity between the two countries and generate positive outcomes. And if you generate positive outcomes, out of the economic connectivity, then you create a certain situation which can help in solving 
the geopolitical issues by increasing trust. The point that Professor Hu made that he said we have so many conversations but basic trust deficit is still there. But how will trust deficit decrease or trust increase to put it positively? It will only be through greater connectivity and greater interaction. So if this is the case that we need to increase economic connectivity and create benefits for both the countries, then are there any concrete things that we can do? Yes, I think we can do concrete things and I'm going to give you four particular examples of where India and China can work to create these positive economic benefits. Firstly, recent research has revealed, and there is a McKinsey study and there are various others which have studied globalization in the past five years. And what is happening is that the trend in globalization is changing. Globalization in the last five years has become more regionalized. In other words, trade and investment uh, and information and data are increasing within regions, within large regions, whether you take ASEAN or NAFTA or European Union or uh, the Russian um, Economic Federation or Mercosur, they are increasing faster and long distance trade, investment, etc., while it is also increasing, is moving, increasing slow, let me put it that way. Therefore, this means that we have to pay attention to regionalization. And regionalization, especially in Asia, is a huge potential because Asian countries including India and China, are still amongst the fastest growing countries in the world. Therefore, Asia is growing very fast and there is a trend of regionalization. Surely the future lies there. We have to look at it. Now, this brings up two questions. One is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Program, RCEP. What is going to happen to it? And if you follow the logic of what I just said, it is very clear that we should settle the RCEP in this year, 2019, which is the which is the stated goal. And to settle that, to cut a complicated story short, the main hitch is in the trade between China and India. And Indian industry or a segment of Indian industry is concerned about the fact that a completely open free trade zone will flood India with goods and create a huge disruption and therefore there is a discussion about a transition period that will allow a certain amount of adjustment. This is what is, as I understand, the key issue now which is pending. Now, it is worthwhile looking at this in the long term because if a proper transition period can be agreed, then two, the two largest economies in Asia going forth can be connected with greater benefit and the least pain. And this is something I would commend our Chinese friends to look at very, very carefully. The second area of globalization is that talked of BRI and it was very correctly uh, put that uh, uh, I think Dr. Xavier mentioned it, that there are different models of globalization. Manoj also mentioned, mentioned <coughs> BRI is one, the US Build Act is the other, Japan has got a third. There is a marketplace for glo globalization and therefore uh, there has to be introspection if a particular globalization product is working or not working, you have to ask why. So suppose I am selling this telephone and a customer is not buying it, I have to ask him, why are you not buying this phone and see what I need to do about it. So whether it is BRI or whether it is the, the uh, 
Asia, Africa, Global Corridor, and many of the others, globalization models have been catered to what the customers want, which means what emerging countries and players like India want, because they are going to be the biggest partners. Now, moving on to the next area of potential collaboration, one of the uh, one of the places India-China rivalry, and I've talked about rivalry and competition and what does, that does as against collaboration, cooperation. One of the biggest areas of rivalry is in India's neighborhood, whether it is Sri Lanka or Maldives or Bangladesh, there is a mutual perception of rivalry. You're doing this, I'm doing that, etc., etc. Now, why cannot we create a cooperative narrative in some of these countries so that the public outcomes is visible to the Chinese and Indian publics about India and China are different? Why cannot there be cooperative projects, say, in Nepal or in Myanmar and so on? Um, yes, I am aware that after the Wuhan uh, uh, summit, there has been a discussion and there is indeed a cooperative project in Afghanistan. But to the, the, the normal public, such as myself, what is happening in that cooperative project uh, is very little known. Is, is something working? Is it not working? What is the public impact? Really speaking, for a cooperative project to have an impact, it must be visible and it must be something that touches a large segment of people, then there is a visible impact of cooperation. So there needs to be, to conclude this point, a choice of some visible, high-profile projects in neighboring countries to share common neighborhoods with <coughs> India and China to make this point that the India-China narrative is also about collaboration. Thirdly, we started by talking about maritime pollution and some serious problems which are affecting the environment. Now, global warming and climate change is going to impact India and China the worst, according to the latest scientific survey that was released. So, why are these two countries not collaborating to a greater extent in science and technology, which is addressed at combating climate change. After all, we have collaborated in international conferences, we have worked together for policy, but why are we not setting up science and technology collaboration in the area of climate change? I can take other areas which have huge impact on the public. Take malaria, take antibiotic resistant tuberculosis, these are big killers, both in China and India. Why cannot India and China set up scientific collaboration projects to produce public health products in these areas? This will create a huge impact in both countries. Mm. And there are other areas of forestry, oceans and so on. I will uh, not take up more time. But since India and China have the largest scientific manpower in the world and these big issues, it defies, it defies belief that we are not collaborating in these areas. Again, in the field of business, this kind of phenomenon would be completely both unknown and unacceptable. Now let me come, because time is running out, let me come to my final point of uh, collaboration, which is about people to people. Now, this is a favorite in all conferences and is talked about endlessly, but the results are very, very weak. India China tourism is a total of 1 million. More than 100 million Chinese go abroad, 20 million Indians go abroad. So, this number is really very low. But and the solutions are also well known. I won't give you the details. There are other papers which I can quote, go into the detail. 
clearly this is an area that can work and work very fast because no major political issues are involved. But there is an even better area which is faster and more effective and that is virtual connectivity and virtual people to people connect. Now I don't know how many of you know that a Chinese app called TikTok Thotiao <coughs> has got a market valuation of 800 million US dollars and it has got very large number of viewers, 600 million viewers in China and 20 million viewers in India. 20 million people in India are interacting, is 20 times the physical tourism are interacting on this app. The two largest apps as per The Economist in terms of English language teaching as a second language are in India. The large numbers of Chinese are on this. Now, what I'm saying is, this area has been neglected by think tanks. But there is a huge potential in internet connectivity. And people are actually connecting with or without the government. They are on internet. The Indian use, users on Chinese apps, Chinese users on Indian apps, and nobody is really doing very much about it in terms of thinking through the potential of this area. And this is a huge area where positive attitudes can be generated fairly quickly if we apply our mind on it. We have not applied our mind on it and we should apply our mind on it. So I think with this, I see from my stopwatch that I've covered, taken 16 minutes. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ravi. Well, now and the question of Dr. Fu Mangzhar to make the presentation. Yeah, he's uh, almost uh, going out. And uh, then always uh, uh, limited, even in the kind of event forever. But we have schedule, and we should uh, end uh, at 15, at uh, 115, and we have another meetings. So I'm another, I'm another um, uh, specialist uh, for India studies. And, uh, uh, but I respect the, 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 the schedule that the seminar gave us. And uh, my colleague also gave my, gave my uh, some reference uh, materials. And uh, here, so I will simply uh, give some introduce uh, uh, point of view of from the China scholars. Uh, generally speaking, the, the, the general uh, Improvement, uh, <coughs> improvement of China India's relationship is underway ever since uh, the Premier uh, Modi's last uh, April's visit in, in Wuhan. Uh, in, uh, Wuhan is the lake, you know. Uh, and um, but uh, we are we are Chinese scholar are skeptical whether there is a, a long term trend or a uh, short term trend. We don't have uh, consensus. Chinese government also uh, use uh, the five T to, uh, to describe uh, describe the, the China and Indian relationship. One is uh, Tibet. The second one is a uh, is a uh, territory. Is a boundary. It of course it is easily to pick the national sentiment both countries and uh, not easy to uh, resolve in short times. The third one is uh, is uh, is uh, third one is uh, the is the third party. Uh, the third uh, the, 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 the trade trade yes trade. You know you just uh, probably just say that we are we reached uh, almost uh, one hundred billion US dollar. It is it, almost okay uh, compared with the past uh, couple of years. Yeah. And uh, we also face. Uh, uh, the problem of, of trade imbalance, and uh, I believe that uh, we can overcome this, uh, in, uh, this imbalance in the future with with the, with the, the further improvement of, of our economic relations. The the fourth is uh, is uh, the third uh, the third party, the third side maybe. 
curl, 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 curl side. Yeah. Yeah, India uh, uh, worry about uh, China. China um, develop his relationship with, with India's uh, uh, label. Yeah, yeah, and maybe uh, uh, formulate uh, the situation of comparing India. China also worry about that. Uh, India maybe uh, take side. Uh, with with the U.S., with uh, Japan, with Australia to uh, counter our con our, our, our concern China. So this is basically this this, this is the 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 third the third the third 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 party. India is the third 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 party. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, the last one is 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 is, 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 is the last one is 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 the Trust, you know, trust. Uh, yeah, you can say trust. Plus, deficit. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, 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 the, the better relations of uh, China and the U.S. and, and India depends on our, our efforts to resolve the problems that we just, uh, we just talked about. Certainly, um, some uh, problems maybe, is, maybe uh, take, uh, take, take, take longer times. And some, uh, and some, and, and, and for the, the, the media trust, we may be uh, gradually develop our CBA, CBA, CBM. CBM, yes. But my, my, my personal opinion of point is that China India relationship are depends on, depends on our both sides to deal with the domestic uh, our political uh, problems. But in the other hand, in large degrees, our relationship also depends on on the international and the world demands and the challenges that both countries face in the future. One is China, US and uh, India's will 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 afford the responding to uh, uh, driving the world economy and global globalization. From the independence of India and the, and the, and the, and the foundation of the Republic of China, Western media, Western officials, scholars, and others, they, they are like to uh, compare India, China, as a developing, uh, as two developing countries. In some aspects, India may be better. In some aspects, China may be better. But today, we are totally, both countries totally face a new situation. We come here, we, are, we, take, we, are, we, we see that uh, India is a dynamic country, especially in recent years, enjoy rapid economic growth rate. And, uh, and uh, China is also maintained relatively economic growth rate. That is, uh, uh, it may be, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, according to uh, to uh, some of these uh, statistics, that uh, China, India may, may make great contribution to global economic growth. Maybe uh, the whole developing countries and, and emerging countries may be uh, contributed 80%. Uh, global growth rate. Second one is uh, that um, uh, we should uh, stand together to deal with the, in the, the change of international systems. Especially, uh, we are the member of, of uh, BRICS, member of uh, SCO, Sahara Cooperation Organizations, and an also member of APEC, G20s. So, 
we also know is that the, the world um, power structure it changed rapidly. The voice of the developing country become stronger than than in the in the past. So China and India maybe play positive roles in dealing with the change of international systems. The third one is uh, is the demand for global governance. Mr. Rami just said that we face a lot of challenges. Both countries come on, uh, face. For example, just maritime, maritime, maritime issues, uh, climate change, and the kind of terrorism, regional and the government uh, uh, governance. So, I, uh, uh, so, so, I'm uh, cautiously confident that the China-India relationship uh, may enter in a new stage and with, uh, with, a, with, with a, a long time stable characteristic. <coughs> and uh, time or 20 years uh, later, China India may be the kind the largest, the largest, and the second largest uh, e uh, e uh, economy in in the countries. So we should uh, have some strategic uh, thinking to manage our bilateral relations now as soon as possible to fill the furious demands that that that, that interest uh, that is in in the interest of of uh, both country and also in the interest of the Asian or in, in the Pacific or the global. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fu, for those remarks and also for your cautious optimism that India-China relations uh, can potentially enter a new phase if we show no adequate uh, strategy thinking in both countries. Uh, uh, since we are running out of time, I'll request General Sani to make some brief comments. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, may, may I take off from where uh, Dr. Fu left off? I think the key issue for future relationship is development of trust between India and China. And I think uh, what you alluded to, the border issue, uh, Progress on the border issue and resolution of the uh, perceptions along the line of actual control will actually contribute greatly in changing perceptions both in India and in China to see that there is greater trust and greater faith in each other's uh, future engagements across other sectors. Uh, when I look at this, I think uh, two positive things have happened. Firstly, you're mentioning it here, and I'm told uh, just about the uh, uh, end of last month, uh, we had Mr. Daivingo here, and he again talked about relooking at the border issues, at the points of conflict and uh, uh, concern which have been identified earlier uh, in the various levels of talks that have been held earlier. So I think uh, two issues that we really need to look at out here. Uh, a relook at the CBMs, the existing methodologies need to be upgraded to meet the changing perceptions of both India and China. Uh, when we look at CBMs, I think greater sharing of information, looking at greater connectivity. We have already established links between Chengdu and, uh, and, and Eastern Command in Calcutta. We are looking at is establishing the same with our DGMO. I think greater level of engagement at the point of contacts which we have, whether it is in the Tawang area, whether it is in Kibitu or whether it is in the area of Lelata, wherever these points are, I think greater one-on-one -on -one communication linkages need to be established. I think the proposal from the Indian side for increasing these point of engagements along this vast border of 4,000 kilometers uh, needs to be looked at and given a, a greater fillip. I mean, we've talked about another eight or nine new places of engagement where we should be there so that there is faster uh, resolution of conflict and sharing of information so that there is no wrong perception in the manner we conduct each other or we deal with that each other when we do have a face-off like we've had earlier. We've had some nasty situations, but we've been very pragmatic in being able to resolve it. I think things have changed. We need to relook really at it. Mm -hmm. I think the issue, the third issue that we really need to look at is I think the aspect of military to military engagement. Uh, it's been happening at the official level. We've been doing it with other parts of the world. I think it has to get in more into the uh, unstructured realm. 
Uh, if we are having garrisons which are sitting in Kipitu across the border at 10 kilometers each, uh, sporting engagement, talking to each other, having uh, uh, cultural engagements with the population on both sides will actually enhance trust. There are proposals of these kinds which need to be re-looked at again uh, a little more pragmatically. And I think the last thing is the format of military to military engagement, that is army to army engagement, needs again to be upgraded. Uh, as of now, it is left to small company level exercises. I think there is scope and there have been great proposals from both sides to try and enhance this act activity. So this would be as far as the security. I'll quickly flag the two or three issues related to uh, some more benign sectors. That's where we should be looking at. If this year has been, or if this century has been the century of digitization and IT, I think the future century of the 22nd is going to be the century of biology. And I think there's great amount of traction happening between the universities in Kunming with uh, the northeastern agencies in India who are looking at a large amount of collaborative projects, looking at biomass, bio, genetics and related subjects, which is really the future for both India and China. Uh, I think uh, the first good thing that has happened is that there is already an India-China Climate Change Commission that is being set up. Uh, I think uh, it's getting unofficial clearance from both the governments. Uh, the uh, Chinese government has already contributed about 500 uh, million through the uh, support of the industry that is already operating here. It has been pledged. The same is being done from Indian side. It's at a very nascent stage. It started off in December last year, but it's taking shape now. And hopefully we will see in this climate change area a certain more greater amount of cooperation. Uh, two, three areas where we really need to look at solar and windmill. I think these are two areas where the Chinese are very, very far ahead. These are areas of great concern to India because we are also wanting to look at renewables in a very, very positive manner with the ISR being here. I think the negative impacts of having gone into the sector and sharing that data will help both India and China to be able to develop. We have the Solar Alliance, the largest producer of solar uh, panels are the Chinese and they all come into India. So I think there is greater uh, need for collaboration both in the wind and in the solar energy. Uh, we are looking at uh, clean coal technologies. Uh, your capacity to use these residuals has been far enhanced. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, work also in the same sector. We are setting up our own uh, setups. I think this is an area where we could look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other area, of course, was flagged as blue economy. Uh, but I think water, soil regeneration and uh, capacities which have been identified by China is an area which would be of great collaborative interest to India. And lastly, I think nutritional foods, medicinal areas, uh, it goes all the way back to history when Ayurvedic uh, uh, know-how was transported from here into the old civilizations in China. I think that's an area where medicinal and activities related to nutritional capabilities need to be looked at. Smart cities. And I think lastly, uh, the efforts of the private industry to finally give shape to science and technology needs to be given a fill-up in the academia and in the institutional framework. I mean, what NASCOM has done in Dalian and in Guzao by setting up in the last one year, uh, both the AI and IoT setup and the big data in Guzao, I think these collaborative projects where it's seeing participation of the Indian as well as the Chinese companies coming in, these are areas which need to be taken up to the next level at the academia and other kind of people. Uh, with that said, I'll close and flag off. Thank you very much. I realize the time is extremely short. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, time is short, but you know, I'll request, you know, we have two former Indian ambassadors to China, Ambassador Das Gupta and Ambassador Nambia. So I'll request Ambassador Das Gupta to like to make some comments. No, that you are just listening with great interest and have learned a great deal from the presentations made by Yoga Chinese friends in the Like I think uh, the last speaker should have mentioned the intelligence cooperation also between the two countries because there is a lot of suspicion. I work in the mm -hmm. intelligence area. I find there is a tremendous amount of suspicion of uh, both Pakistan and China as, you know, we need to have intelligence cooperation as well. Why not? We can talk to each other, understand each other's problems, and also find some solutions. Actually, it's happening. We don't talk about it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, no more time. Yeah. yeah, we discussed uh, India-China relations, but we, I think, shied away from a very important issue, <coughs> namely terrorism, and to be specific, the case of Masood Nazar. I just want to say something about this. Uh, I don't think 
China's relations with Pakistan will anyway be dented if Masood Azhar is declared a terrorist, whereas it will create a lot of goodwill in India, and that will be a very important CV. Thank you. I think I think we'll just have to. You can discuss over over lunch. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> no, I just want to make. Uh, of course, I'll uh, discuss the issue of bias uh, over lunch. I hope this means they get for me also. Just one quick point. You see, we have not talked about the media. I think. Uh, may I? Please, please go. Yeah, okay. So one point actually is that you know when these think tanks meet. There can actually be joint papers on different aspects of our relationship, even contention issues, which can actually be put out in the media, uh, Indian media and the Chinese media. And similarly, actually, it can also be in the in the in our in our in our television channels where this can be put, and that will actually make a great impact in terms of the nature of the cooperation we're having with the two countries. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We're very gracious of you. <laughs> Uh, my question is to my Chinese friends on this uh, on the Belt Road Initiative or OBOR, and it was mentioned that China would like India to be a partner in the Belt Road Initiative. Well, we have been looking at it very carefully, closely. We are unlikely to join the initiative uh, at least in a hurry. But there is one clarification that I would like to seek. Uh, the other day, China has uh, given a 30% rebate to Ma to Malaysia uh, to encourage them to come back to uh, the Belt Road Initiative uh, of China, a 30% reduction in the cost. Now, is it that typically the Belt Road projects that China is offering to friendly countries has a 30% cushion? or a margin, uh, or, or is it that it's a political price that is given uh, regardless of the economic considerations? I just wanted to know that. Thank you. I'd like to make a brief comment on BRI. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I am speaking from here. Can I make a brief comment yeah, yeah. on the BI? I, 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 I just, uh, there was some, I can I reference to, to Mr. Alan Sakhani, uh, questions. And uh, I'm uh, very agree uh, with Mr. Ravi's point of, uh, of views on um, 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 people to give us contact. It's, a, it's a very important. But, uh, during the uh, China US also lack of uh, uh, trust, especially uh, during the end of uh, uh, century uh, transition, you know. Especially during, uh, during the uh, Clinton administration, uh, President Clinton encouraged China's army to contact with the US army, even not just uh, the high level officials contact. It encourages soldier to soldier contact. We can have some uh, as scholar, you know, I just um, I, 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 I don't think represent, represent the official positions. Why not India and China can have such a contact from the soldier to soldier? Uh, except uh, besides the government to government, people to people, uh, enterprise to enterprise, and uh, and yeah, and tourist to uh, tourist, you know. So we can cooperate in the framework of UN, for example, PKO, right? And we can have some cooperation, military cooperation, con uh, military con uh, conduct as a framework of uh, LCO, the joint view, military exercise. But uh, maybe uh, it's easy to trick them, uh, Pakistan's worry. But we can talk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, as for the Belgian road, I I, I, I may be uh, uh, answer your uh, questions at the, 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 the round table. <laughs> 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 and, and here I wanted to uh, to uh, deliver my sincere thanks, 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 Ambassador uh, Kang, uh, Kanga. Right? Thank you for your, your favorable arrangements for our Chinese delegation to visit here, especially. Uh, 
Uh, you are fan of drama, a former uh, member. This is the first time he went here. And uh, he was this opportunity to understand uh, India, New Delhi, Delhi, and the uh, village, and other place. We can have a good uh, knowledge, a little bit of knowledge, and we may be, uh, have some uh, uh, new driving force to. Uh, to know, to know more about the Indian institution and all of you. Thank you very much. Bro. I would also like to thank you know, Vice President Food Mangza and other colleagues from Pikir who have come here and a very productive, stimulating conversation this morning. Coming as this visit, uh, soon after visit of His Excellency Dapingo, and a high level delegation headed by him late late last month on 26th March. I think these conversations have contributed quite a bit to generating better understanding about each other's positions and equally important to know throwing up new ideas that can be pursued uh, both at track one level as also at track two levels with two countries. So thank you very much and uh, now it's my Pleasure to invite you to join us for lunch in the joining room.